Welcome to the Floor Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hedin, owner of Illustrious Hardwoods in Phoenix, Arizona. We are here to talk with flooring professionals from all across the country about the issues that matter to you. This week's guest is Jeremy Waldorf. Jeremy is a returning guest, and he has years of experience in the flooring industry from multi-unit residential, residential and light commercial. He's recently moved on from laying floors to be a rep for Shonox. Today, we're talking about something that is near and dear to Jeremy's heart. That topic is PPE, or personal protective equipment. A lot of guys and gals may scoff at it, but Jeremy has a story to tell that may make you think twice about putting on that dust mask the next time you're at the saw, opening up a bag of level, or grout. Listen in to learn why you need to protect yourself now. Jeremy Waldorf, are you on the line? I am here. Awesome. Welcome back to what is now the Floor Academy podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, this is a big topic for you. I know it I know it hits very close to home. Um, so we're gonna be discussing PPE, personal protective equipment. And you were the first guy I thought of to to ask to do this um when i when i knew i wanted to do a show about it so why don't we have you introduce yourself again give us the the background of you know where you came from and and where you where you are now and then uh let's let's dive into your story a little bit sure yeah i, I appreciate you having me back on again i uh I have been in the flooring world basically my whole life i started out as the son of, of, a, of an installer and obviously it was a scrappy, uh, you know, at a young age, probably six or seven. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, it's, you know, running behind dad and picking up carpet scraps for 20 bucks a day if you're lucky and, you know, sticking it out when you're a kid. And then I grew up and tried uh, multiple different career paths, including pizza delivery, which obviously doesn't pay the bills, as well as flooring and ended up back in the trade for myself, uh, subcontracting for my dad for quite a while. Um, eventually going out on my own, specializing in, in hard surface, uh, NWFA certified installer and inspector, uh, CTI certified tile installer. I was a four bow associate mechanic for a while and then, um, you know, did pretty well transitioning from commercial and multifamily underneath uh, my dad's company into mostly residential and light commercial with my own company, Legacy Floors, back Probably, I think that was around 1997 is when I made that transition. And I was there doing well until January of 2019 when I took a position as a technical sales representative for HPS Shernox here in the Michigan, Toledo, and Northern Indiana area, where I've been uh, ever since helping to train other professionals in floor prep uh, and uh, techniques and also educate them on the world of everything that goes underneath everything that we find so important uh, in our trade. So that is kind of the the quick summary of where I've come from and, and where I am now. That's uh you know that's a wide varying range of things. You went from multi-unit dwellings to residential, light commercial, um, specializing with HPX Shonox now in subfloor prep and, and underlayments and, you know, they got shower stuff going on. And, and so, it, you know, that's a, that's a wide range of things to have. And then I know you said you were NWFA certified. So dealing with hardwood and you know, that's, you just, that's a lot of experience to, to come from. Yeah, you so. know, and if I'm being completely honest, it, all of that is just so that I can keep from you kicking in carpet. <laughs> 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 I found out very early at a very, very early age that I had wanted very, you know, as much as little to do with, with carpet installation as possible. I, there's nothing about it that I like doing. And I, I greatly respect those who do it well because um, we need those guys because even now it's even harder to find them. But it was just a uh, hard surface was my my specialty and, and the challenge was, was do everything I could to keep from, from carrying around and kicking in carpet. So I'm um, with that's you. That's really it. Our, our, our buddies, Dan Churchill and, and, uh, PJ, Nate Hall, Scott Zito, they can keep their carpet. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yes. And we're, we're very fortunate and very glad for them. They, yes. they do, they do it well, so we don't have to. And, and they feel the same way about us. So 
Yep. All right. So give me your give me the give me the background here. Why is PPE so important to you? So when I was probably in my 20s, my dad sent us all to class B asbestos removal certification and we went through that so we could be educated on you know the ways to do that kind of uh you know, remediation and, and, uh, you know, type of thing when we come across it, which wasn't all that often, but it was important to have that training and certification for us. Obviously, you know, the daily use of, of safety glasses, uh, dust masks, gloves, when you need them, those kinds of things. I think you encounter those as an installer when they come up, you know, you, you know, you stab yourself in the, in the hand and you think, yeah, gloves would be a good idea. And, mm-hmm. you know, you come home hacking up, uh, you know, we used to have a joke where, you know, we'd come home and blow our nose after a day of doing hardwood and, and you'd look in the napkin and it would say Bruce, uh, you know, you <laughs> yeah. just, everywhere you turn, there's reasons why you should protect yourself. But for me, uh, back in 2017, uh, there was a point where my dad came and, and had the conversation with us that's, you know, told me that basically he had been diagnosed with mesothelioma. Uh, I didn't even really know what it was at that time, other than it was just, uh, you know, the brunt of some jokes, you know, around and, and a lot of commercials that I had seen. But mm-hmm. uh, essentially what has happened, what the, the tile and the adhesives, mo- mostly from removal and disposal, had collected in his lungs. And uh, what happens is it's basically similar to silicosis where it, it's a different kind of cancer in your lungs and it basically it attacks the, you know, the alveoli and the airways in your lungs until, uh, you know, the scarring becomes so much and the, the lungs deteriorate so much that you actually start losing lung capacity and, and essentially suffocating. So he, he fought a pretty hard battle and went for various types of experimental treatments in Texas and uh, all over the place, trying to find an answer in, in every way possible, even you know chemotherapy and and home remedies and, and things like that. And um, eventually, the the mesothelioma won and and took his life. So uh, he was in the trade for over 55 years. There are guys in in my area that grew up and learned from him uh, from a you know even right out of high school or or around there. And he mentored so many guys. Uh, and and taught them so much about the trade, including myself and, and many friends. And he he loved nothing more than working. He mm-hmm. was very passionate about it. But that was what ended up uh, taking him from us. So that's why it was you know even more important to me than it than it even was pr- uh, previously to make sure that that you know that myself and, and others around me are protected and in a, in the work you know during the work day and, and during the exposure to these potential hazards, no matter what they are. And so, uh, I mean, I hate to hear it. it. It's it's heartbreaking. And I remember you coming on Flooring Installers of America with, with your video and originally saying when he had passed and, and that, you know, PPE was like a personal mission of yours. And it, it was very moving and, and touching. And it it makes you think because we all think we're invincible and that this isn't going to do anything. And I'm just sweeping up a room. It's no big deal. It's It's this one time. But that one yeah. time adds up to thousands of times. And... You know, you're going to go do that one cut, that one, that one thing, but it adds up over and over and over again. So when did your mindset on it actually change? Was it before you lost your dad, after you lost your dad, when you took the abatement class? Like, when did you kind of really know this is something that needs to be pushed in our industry? Because still, a lot of guys just laugh it off like it's it, they don't care to have mask yeah yeah that's a good question you know and and you raise a good point i think that it's just that one cut or it's just that one bag of mixture or that one time you're grinding we you know we get lazy or you know my pp's in the truck or it's just inconvenient you know in this homeowner's house um for me it was actually prior to my dad's passing that i started getting really involved even before i got some of my certifications but it it was kind of an increasing awareness and responsibility as I got older. And I mean, I'm 41. So, you know, I only usually had about one apprentice at a time with me working alongside, but it was a cumulative, you know, kind of multidimensional thing where whether it was for my own safety 
or whether it was for my helper or my apprentice working mm -hmm. with me, or whether it was for the safety of the people's whose homes I was working in or the environment that I was at, uh, or the people working around me, there was, it seemed to be always another reason that kind of, that got added to my list of, of just consciousness about PPE and why it was important. I mean, I've been just as guilty as anybody else from time to time of, you know, making a cut on the saw with my uh, safety glasses on my head or, you know, pulling my shirt over my face with, I'm, you know, doing a quick grind or something, you know, a lot less towards, uh, you know, towards these days than, than prior, but it does add up. And, and you really have to think long-term because there are a lot of guys who, who a don't believe that it's a, that it's a danger. Uh, you know, they have that kind of invincibility, you know, about them. And, and there's guys that are always going to feel that way, but the more that you see and the more you experience and, and hear firsthand stories of, of individuals who, I've had accidents, you know, whether it's respiratory or, or otherwise, you know, even in hardwood flooring, um, you know, one of the big things there, and, and this, I guess, may or may not be related to PPE, but I, I kind of think it is um, some of the solvents and some of the finishes that the guys use as far as inhalation oh, and uh, potentially uh, explosive and, and, you know, combustible materials. Yeah, this all count. This is all this all counts. This is all the same category, I think. And, you know, we don't want to blow up or, um, you know, or, or suffocate ourselves. The, I think the impression that guys have is that, you know, whether they smoke or drink or whatever they do, there's no reason to protect themselves uh, otherwise. And, and they're just going to like live a shorter life. You know, one day they're going to be a flip of a switch and, and they're going to live it up until then. But what they don't realize is that the quality of life gets, you know, deteriorates and, and you don't live a good quality of life with these types of, you know, injuries and, and disabilities. And it can happen to anybody out there. I've, you know, been getting regular checkups since, you know, some of the silica laws came into to play it and, and then agree with it or not. It, at a minimum, it, it helped to raise awareness about some of the things that we're mm -hmm. doing and, and understand why, why these issues are important. So, you know, we can protect ourselves and, and maybe not even just for yourself, but for your family, the ones who depend on you to A, uh, you know, bring in, uh, you know, a livelihood for them. And B, more importantly, you know, the kids or, or wife or cousins or nephews or moms and dads who, who need you there for them. And um, if we don't take the precautions to protect ourselves, you know, throughout our career, uh, we're not going to have a very long career and we're not going to have a very uh, good quality of life, you know, when it comes down to it. So that's kind of, you know, where I've arrived at today with PPE and how, you know, how I kind of got there. It really wasn't just one day. Uh, it was just a, a cumulative you know, a process for me. Mm -hmm. uh, do so many good things. Um, I, I, there's so many things I want to hit on and I'm, I, I'm going to try and remember all of them. So that's because I talk a lot. So no, this, this is such a, <laughs> we both know this is such an important topic and it is. it's just guys want to ignore it. So first point you bring up is quality of life. You watched your dad firsthand. So let, let's talk about that quality of life. You know, guys are like, oh, it's just going to, you know, it'll take five years off. It'll take 10 years off. But you know firsthand that's not the way it works. It's not like you if you were going to live to 91 years and 32 days that you live yeah. to 81 years and 32 days. You know, it's exactly. So what was that quality of life like? You know, explain that so we kind of can understand firsthand what, what you really mean by that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, um, I'm going to I'll do my best to keep it you know, together here. You know, as far as uh, it, it, the emotional side of it hits me now and then I'm usually able to talk about it without being affected uh, because I, I just, I talk about it and I, and I don't think too much about, you know, the details, but when my dad was a very private person, so he, he waited a very long time to tell, to tell us he was diagnosed, which I, I honestly, I have some resentment toward him for not, I'm not hanging on to it, but I was, I, I'll rephrase that. I had some resentment mm -hmm. toward him for that. I felt like if we would have known earlier, really, he didn't want anyone to feel sorry for him. And he was, he was never like that. He, he always wanted people to be, um, you know, cared for and didn't want anyone bothered by anything that, that was going on with him. And I think, you know, I don't know about your parents, but my parents are like that. Uh, sometimes they don't want to tell you about medical things because it's some sort of burden. Um, well, they want to be, they want to be the adult. They don't want to be the child. Right. Right. And so, you know, what I noticed really was, you know, Christmas of the previous year, um, you know, he had to wear a scarf around, you know, and then he had his mouth and his nose covered with it. 
because that what I learned later is that the, the air, the cold air breathing in hurt his lungs. Mm. And so even from trips from the car to the inside of, of a Christmas party, you know, that we went to, he would have the scarf over his mouth and nose that he was, you know, breathing. And you could tell there was times when he was getting short of breath and he, he said he was sick, but you know, he was kind of playing it off. Like it was something simple, like a cold or, or a flu, Yeah, uh, you know, that he was fighting off. But really what was happening is, you know, he was losing lung capacity and it was becoming very painful for him to even breathe uh, during regular daily activities. And, uh, you know, every time he would go in and get another x-ray or an examination on his lungs, they would find that that the, the cancer was taking more and more of his lungs each time. And, uh, you know, the more it affected his lungs, the less he was able to breathe and function without having to, you know, to sit down or, or experience a, a great deal of pain, which is hard to watch a, an active person like, like who's someone who throughout the years consistently outworked guys who were 20 and 30 years younger than him every single time. Mm. Uh, and now here he is just, you know, starting to completely fail physically. So that's, you know, kind of how the process worked. And, you know, he ended up dying at his home in his bed after having to go home for hospice and a lot of ugly, you know, things that go along with, you know, end of life scenarios. You know, he, he was a, a guy who, deserve dignity and things like that so i think we can all imagine what that you know what that entails but it was hard to you know to see him he just struggled to get up and go on the deck Mm -hmm. and things like that so so i mean essentially it it, it doesn't sound like it was a super long battle a couple years at the most Uh, about a year i would say i think um from what probably a year and a half total okay i'm guessing and so, I mean, essentially, like fa- fairly quick, but I mean, just quality of life diminished over a year and a half from okay to nothing. And it, it's yeah. not like, like, like I said earlier, you know, it's not like you just lop a couple of years off and you instantly die. You just, yeah, he, he was deteriorating in front of you and that's got to be hard to watch and that's got to be hard to, it's got to be even harder to experience, especially it sounds like he was in amazing man and you know was doing his best to lead people and and raise them up and make them better and he's sitting there struggling to just be able to breathe with just a basic function yeah he you know it was especially i mean a couple things like you said um it was hard you know a year and a half sounds like a a pretty quick you know elapsed time but it it didn't feel didn't feel fast for anybody involved you know Mm -hmm. it, it felt like a very long painful uh, process my dad was one of 17 brothers and sisters which is one of the largest families i've i've heard of and um you know for the entire family it was it was heart heartbreaking to walk and to know um you know fortunately you know a couple of us got to pray with him on occasion which was something that was really um kind of unconventional you know for, for him it was there was times when he you could tell he was scared which was also completely foreign to me to ever see my dad admit sorry that he was scared of anything yeah and um you know that was there's a you know moments like that that will always stick out to me and, and i'll always remember phone calls that he makes to me you know that um you know he's panicking and, and you know legitimately frightened which this is one of the strongest guys i ever met and i know most people would say that about their parents but um you know, for my six-year-old son, who was at that time, uh, you know, he was three. You know, for him especially to watch his papa deteriorate and, and mm-hmm. he's just a kid, you know, he doesn't fully understand what's happening, but he knows something's different and that, you know, papa's changing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he can only visit him certain times and, you know, do certain things. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, difficult because, you know, like you said, he, even through the course of his career, when he had, you know, a young group of installers, guys that, you know, back in, in those days, and I hate to sound like, you know, an old guy, but <laughs> the the working crop was guys who were, you know, 17, 18, 19 through, you know, early 20s, not like it is now typically. And my dad, you know, on more than one occasion would tell these guys, you know, this is your college. You know, this is, you learn, I will teach you anything you want to know and, and I'll, you know, show you everything I know so that you can, you know, guys left him, his company all the time to go, you know, on their own or start other things. And I, I know guys get out of shape about that, but um, he just understood that that's the way things were. 
and that was the cycle of the business. And if he could, you know, take someone and, and show them how to provide, you know, yeah. for their family and teach them these skills, that was what made him happy. And, uh, you know, he gave, you know, again, he gave a lot. And, and that was the kind of the, you know, the hard part about it was watching these transformations and not be able to do, you know, even consulting, you know, towards the end and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it was hard to, to see hard for my family to experience for my, you know, my wife, my sisters, um, you know, his brothers and sisters, it was, uh, it was just hard. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine. I actually, well, my dad's been a smoker for years and years and he's rough right now. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, I don't know how many years we have with him. So I, I mean, I kind of mm-hmm. get it, but he's not on any machines yet. He, he refuses to go to the doctor. I can't get him to quit smoking. You just, yeah, uh, you, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you brought up an interesting thing about your dad, and you said that you'd never seen him scared, and that was an interesting side to see of him. Yeah, I wonder if I can flip that for you and say that it humanized him more for you, and it actually makes you respect him more because it he finally showed you that emotion, and that it, as a man, it's okay to to show that. Yeah, it, it definitely did, and uh, I mean, I. It was my dad was always the kind of guy where I think growing up as a teenager and you know I was even in my twenties I I kind of did my own thing you know I I liked I worked but I didn't I didn't love work then you know it was something that I did to pay my bills and mm-hmm. I was kind of doing my own thing playing in a metal band and hanging out with my buddies and partying and doing whatever um, I was always reasonably responsible and never got into too much trouble but um, you know work was always what we talked about and when I got into my thirties you know even probably until I became a dad myself, it was basically, you know, a lot after that still, but work was the subject when you were with dad, you know, it was whether we were at work, we were talking about work. If we were at a family get together, we were talking about work. It's just, you know, largely because of what what he enjoyed more than anything else, but also because, you know, we didn't really have like a whole lot in common otherwise, Uh, you know, we went to games together and, and stuff like that, but, um, on a personal level. And I, I don't want to minimize that because actually he taught me a lot and we did some projects together that, you know, are, are still here. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, valuable. I, I liked work, you know, when I got a little older as well. So, but it did humanize him, you know, when, when he, you know, when I saw him cry and when, you know, I saw him fearful and, and admitting to me that he was scared was strange, uh, mm-hmm. you know, place to be for me. It was, it was, um, you know, it was just uh, a lot of times it, it kind of kicked my feet out from underneath me. You know, I mean, what do you tell your dad when he tells you he's scared to die? Um, you know, I didn't, there's no books on this, you know, I yeah. mean, there probably is, but I, it, every situation is so different that, you know, you just try to be there for him and, and encourage them. And, you know, like I said, I mean, regardless of, you know, of what, you know, people's beliefs are or, or things like that. I mean, the fact that I, I did get to pray with him and, and, and give him some comfort and try to just be there for him when he mm-hmm. needed, you know, help or needed anything and, and call him. Uh, it wasn't easy. There were some situations that were kind of, you know, in place that made things difficult, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was humanizing, you know, it was, uh, the kind of thing you don't want to see, uh, you know, in some ways your parents, I think they don't, they're not always realistic or open with us. They, they like to keep things sheltered and, you know, there's nothing like knowing you're going to die uh, to really break down your walls and, and make you vulnerable and open to, you know, what happens next. And mm-hmm. and so uh, to have family around that cared and was able to, uh, you know, help him as much as he asked was uh, was important. So. Oh, I, you know, <clears throat> thank you for uh, this is deep, man. This is. Uh... Just being willing to share this, I, I truly, truly appreciate it. I, I really do. I think uh, everyone that listens is going to be able to get something out of this because it's it, it makes this all so much more personal. Well, I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. I think if, if nothing else good comes of this, you know, and uh, when you know he died, he was seventy three. I think he was seventy three, which means he had a lot of life left. He could have been living now today. Well, um, you know, 73 isn't that old. I mean, it's old, but it's not correct. It's not old and, enough to be gone. And that's I. Well, so I, I mean, I want to keep going, but I don't want to. I, 
like I said, I, I appreciate you f- t- being willing to talk about your dad and, and open up and, and share that because I know it's emotional and rough. Um, sure. But, you know, so we talked about kind of like quality of life is suffering. Um, A lot of times guys don't think about long term. You know, we, yeah. we all know our knees are going to get shot you know, depending on how long we stay on the floor. And and so you can convince a guy to get knee pads really easily, but to put a mask on and say, this is going to help you or put a pair of gloves on or some safety glasses. So you don't take a piece of, you know, shrapnel to the eye. Um, I personally, like I, my son is 10. I, Mm -hmm. and I know you just said your son's six. Man, yeah. I'd love to see grandkids running around one day, and I want to be able to run around with them. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, it's hard to convince a twenty-year-old of anything because I know you wouldn't have told you wouldn't have convinced me to wear a mask at twenty. You just you wouldn't. Have. Yeah. Um, but I think that's our responsibility. So let's kind of go down that road. You know, how do we get guys to think? long term instead of in the moment especially when we have these apprentices starting at 18 19 20 25 and they're just hard-headed sure. idiots <laughs> and i mean yeah, that in the I, nicest I, way you're right yeah no i mean i i think i was probably pretty dumb till i was about 31 i mean i'm you know i'm not a genius now but um i i thought i had you know most of it figured out but you know, there's, it's humility smacks you in the head one day. And I think that, you know, it's a combination of things. Number one, being young, number two, most of us being guys, uh, you know, I think we're particularly stubborn. There's that, that meme, right? That billboard that says most men will die from stubbornness and then someone spray paints. No, we won't. (laughs) Um, you know, it's, it's that whole thing where we, if it doesn't hurt today, then we don't want to think about it, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's the, it's those long-term progressive type things that uh, we we find a little easier to put in the back of our mind. If I don't get smacked in the face with a with a board that gets you know that binds up on the table saw and you know it doesn't have an immediate pain you know source for me, then I can dismiss it for a while. And uh, I think education is really the key. You know, with with the the silica you know laws. I think as we go on, you know, asbestos is is eventually going to be you know, a lot lower, even, even is now a lot lower concern in terms of quantity of product out there, uh, anymore, either being abated or encapsulated mm-hmm. as we find it. But, you know, the silica, you know, is more prominent and the, the normal things, you know, even hearing loss, uh, uh, you know, the air quality vapors, those kinds of things, um, you know, education, just understanding what these things are we're working with and, and what, what they can potentially do. You know, we, a lot of guys get torn up for wearing, you know, latex gloves or, 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 um, you know, something like, you know, similar type of protection when they're working with chemicals and, uh, you know, that might have a long-term impact or you may, you know, bring, you know, bring those chemicals home on your hands and, and bring them home into your, your, you, you really want to leave work at work. Yeah. You know, we, we, we think about work at home and that's fine. I mean, there's no way around that for a lot of us, but we don't want to be bringing these workplace hazards back home to our family either. So you know, changing shoes and, and doing those kinds of things that we don't really consider, you know, a big part of the deal. The last time I had a conversation with a guy about, you know, asbestos removal uh, on a one-to-one, you know, uh, kind of you know situation was at a union training, um, you know, down in Indianapolis, one of the, the younger guys, he was in his early twenties and, you know, he asked me about it and, you know, it kind of came up, but it, it was just kind of, you know, I kind of talked to him about it a little bit and he, he just didn't understand how serious it was. And, you know, he, he was, you know, what do I do when I, you know, go to the job and I'm the only one wearing a mask and, and everyone's looking at me funny and, and those kinds of things. And I just told him, you know, you know, th- these guys aren't going to listen. Some of these guys are, are, are they're going to ignore the dangers and you have to just, you have to be strong enough to think for yourself mm-hmm. like you, like you are and not worry about what everyone else is doing or thinking about you. And sometimes you'll also encourage other people just by doing that to to, to, to join with you and, uh, you know, be as inconvenient as it is sometimes. And I, I understand it is, uh, but to be safer and to, to have that kind of culture of safety that we'd, we'd like to see more of, I think, in the workplace. And it's nice when employers 
uh, and and facilities managers and things kind of help you with that. You know, having uh, I was a big fan, you know, especially towards you know the later part of the installation of having a shop vac with a HEPA filter like within arm reach, basically anywhere I'm at. So if I'm going to be mixing some product, I can put the vacuum, you know, right in the vacuum port. Yeah. If I'm going to be undercutting casings, almost every tool can either be, you know, bought with or retrofitted with some sort of a vacuum port. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, sometimes I didn't even need to wear a mask because I had enough suction coming out of that vacuum where I could eliminate that at the source and not have to contaminate the workplace, you know, with that dust that, you know, if it doesn't get you when it comes out of the, uh, you know, the work, the working action, the next time you come by and, and create some movement or some, you know, air from one of your nailers, you're, you're going to fire that stuff back up in the air again. And so I think just more education on safety, you know, is, is helpful for guys to be able to kind of use it in a practical way where it's not so encumbering that it, you know, you have, uh, you know, like an ET suit on by the time you're done. There's shortcuts and ways to do this stuff easier um, mm -hmm. so that you're not, you're not as restricted. Well, so let's let's break it down, okay? We know if we're out doing a solid wood floor install and we have some oak, it's a carcinogen, okay? Oak sawdust is going to cause cancer. Um, if you think that you're working with that laminate and or an engineered wood and it's not going to harm you, you're sadly mistaken. Who knows where and what that was glued with in China or whatever Southeast Asian country it was made in. I don't care if it's made in America. Sure. Who knows what you're cutting into? Um, vinyl. Well, now you got who knows what kind of composite material floating around and you're breathing it in. Um, mm. Ear protection. Your earbuds are not ear protection. Putting those in your ear and turning on the grinder and putting them in at full blast, you're only damaging your hearing more. Um, the gloves, you make a really good point with like the, the hardwood guys having to put down finishes and stains and, um, maybe cleaning or something up with, with denatured. Or... Uh, yeah. You got the, you know, you're going to have some kind of lacquer thinner or denatured alcohol to clean up with. And you're just absorbing into your hands if you're not wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so many things, you know, uh, you brought up like it does reduce technology and some of the, uh, thin sets, self levelers, grouts, those kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, obviously mixing products, you're going to be looking for, you know, different ways to help, you know, curb some of that exposure. Um, like you said, high protection, you know, those kinds of things. And I'm sure we're missing some, but, uh, you know, whatever you're missing, you'll figure it out when you get hurt next time, right? I mean, that's oh. kind of how, how we do it. <laughs> I hope you don't get hurt. I hope you don't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, so, look, I honestly, like, shameless plug, my Isotunes headphones are absolutely amazing. There's a link in the in the podcast description, but they're, they're OSHA rated. And so they work as earplugs, but they're headphones and I can still put earmuffs on over it. So it's kind of like mm. two in one. I can listen to music at half volume and it's really loud when I'm sitting there with a S26 vacuum hooked up to my seven inch grinder doing a floor and I can't hear the vacuum. Yeah. I can hear the music and I can barely hear the grinder. Like, yeah, that's a nice convenience. Yeah. You got to take time to invest in yourself with the right equipment. Yes, it costs money. Charge more. <laughs> that, yeah. Go and you can then you can afford this stuff. Don't cheap out on yourself because you are your only investment. And it's I ugh. we hammer away at it. Your body only works so long. And you need to build that into the cost when you're selling a, a project because you're selling your body to somebody right now. And I like don't you guys are all immature. I get it. I said you're selling your body. Ha ha ha. Uh, yeah. ha. yeah, we're not, yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> I can hear him now. Right? It, it, no, but you literally we're selling our body. Like we're ruining our knees, we're ruining our back, we're ruining who knows what else, our lungs, our, our, everything. You've yeah. got to well, account I, that cost in. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, you know, one thing that I, I got used to doing when I was going out, you know, it this this type of stuff will actually help you sell jobs. Because especially in a residential, you know, application, and I mean, a commercial has kind of its own rules anyways, but in a residential application, when I would come in and I knew, 
I always assume that I'm going to be quoting somebody uh, for a job that someone else has already given them a quote for, or that, or that they will be getting another quote from, well, especially when it comes to demo or, you know, any angle that you're going to be doing there, mention to them about all the steps you're going to be taking with regard to health and safety, because um, number one, they're going to know that you're protecting yourself, but you're really going to be able to show them that you're protecting them as well. Uh, you know, if I had quoted a job one time for, especially a ceramic tile demo, um, you know, obviously now we have ways where we can get around, you know, the demolition a lot of times, but when there isn't a way to get around it, uh, you know, we would stress the fact that, you know, I have a $1,900 HEPA vac and, uh, you know, plastic sheeting will be put up everywhere with zip walls. We have positive airflow moving out all the windows or negative airflow, you know, whichever way mm -hmm. you want to present it. Um, all of your cupboards will be covered in, in plastic, you know, that we will let this exposure to the immediate area that's being uh, worked on. And this will be safer for your family. And I guarantee you, um, most of those other guys, if any that are, are competing against you, will not bring those things up. You know, if they if they're just that's a, a topic that they're going to try and get around or or they might just try and kind of shortcut on. And if you can market yourself as someone who's, uh, you know, health conscious as an installer, you're going to walk away with more jobs and they'll be able to charge more. The, the time that I that I gave them that quote, uh, that was for a very special job that they needed as much of the money as they could. And they hired um, a company that that was a fly by night demo company. They came in by the time we showed up to install the wood. Uh, there was, there was fine uh, dust from the mud bed throughout all three levels of the house, mm -hmm. upper middle and lower level of the house inside the cabinets, all over the glasses, uh, inside the speakers, every single crack crevice corner. Oh yeah. Uh, per perforation was covered in dust and Months it was, tra it was tragic. I mean, you'll never clean all of that out no. of the house. No, not even if you have the vent company come in. Are you going to get rid of it all? No. That's so. So that's insane. a way to make more money and keep your, you know, keep yourself and your customers safer. And and especially, I think moving forward now, uh, that might even be more of a selling point after you know what we're currently going through in terms of, of safety. Um, you know, and again, you know, we don't have to go there on on wholesale, but but health and cleanliness probably has never been more important to your clients moving forward now. C correct. And I mean, look, we can date the episode. So Jeremy's talking about, obviously, for the people that listen to this, when it when it comes out, you'll know that this is coronavirus time, but this thing's going to live on the internet for a long time. So this is this is what we're going to this is going to come out April 1st of, of 2020. So it's it's coronavirus time. And you're right. You, moving forward, I think because of this, people will be more health conscious and want to know what are you going to do to protect me um right something i did to help protect myself because i was sick of, everything's concrete slabs down here and i was mm. sick of sweeping up rooms and turning it you know it, it'd be a 10 by 12 bedroom or you know 14 by 10 bedroom whatever it is yeah i'd close the door you sweep up the room and it becomes a dust cloud Mm -hmm. And you're just standing it. And I got sick of it. And I, I started thinking, I was like, oh, you know, I used to work at a warehouse and we had to put this stuff on the floor. Like, whoa, whoa, oh, sweeping compound. So I use sweeping yeah. compound on all my jobs now. And it vastly reduces the amount of dust that's that's created. I know a lot of guys sure. that, that vacuum floors instead of sweeping them now. Um, I do both. I just find it works better. I don't think the vacuum always gets everything. Sure. But it, there are ways. Uh, people will argue that the sweeping compound is going to leave a residue behind. Some of them do leave an oily residue. So if you're going to yeah. put glue down, um, find one you're that so doesn't manu leave you're, a you're residue so behind. You're manufacturer conscious, Kyle. I was, you, you beat me to the punch. I'd check with your flooring, finished flooring manufacturer to make sure that you're <laughs> using a compound that will work. Obviously, yeah. some of them do. Some of them don't. We've seen the ones that leave oil spots. But like you said, multi-prong approach, right? There's guys that in, in companies I know that had broom burning parties. Uh, I think we always find a place where we're going to need a broom somewhere, but you're, you know, you're being smart by doing it the right way and minimizing that, you know, the amount of time that you're just going to be pushing that stuff through the air, you know, and, and maybe for, you know, moving forward, like you said, fine, you know, pre-cleaning, you know, uh, during the job cleaning and final cleaning, mm -hmm. you know, this might be a, a way for guys to, 
you know, this isn't something we have to keep to ourselves. We can share this with our clients and definitely and maybe look at this as a potential source of extra revenue. Um, if not directly, you know, by just giving them the assurance that they're getting more value out of your services, because when you leave, maybe now you take some hardwood floor cleaner and you spray it all over the, the finished floor and you wipe your way out. Or maybe you, you know, do the same thing with whatever finished floor covering you're, you're putting in and just give them that impact that they're going to tell their friends about. Well, and it, it, this is something that I've been trying to figure out for a long time. I haven't found the right company to work with that I can get good numbers from. But find a way to work with a local cleaning company that's a mom and pop operation, probably, and build it into your bid that they're going to come out. They're going to clean the home after you finish. Not only is mm -hmm. that going to keep that company a little bit busier because they're going to have constant like one off stuff to like fill. Sometimes they'll have a whole house. Sometimes it's a room. Sometimes it's a bathroom, whatever it is, like come sure. up with work with them to come up with a, a way to price it and build it into your bid. You know, it, they can yeah. come out, they can disinfect the entire thing the next day when you're when you're done or, you know, maybe well, they come out the last day. Who knows? That's true. But you know, or, or there's there's options as far as uh you know, I've one thing I specialized in in the past was maintaining uh, oil finished wood floors. Something that I've always done. I got you know to learn the skill, and you know even when things might get a little slow here and there, um, from time to time, I I'll reach out to my customers. On, you know, maybe on a Saturday and come out, and uh, you know check with them. You know, spend a couple hours on the job, you know, cleaning and refreshing their floors. Or you could do the same thing with, you know, cleaners and sealers for for tile or grout. You know, get creative and, and, you know, maybe you hire a company that you're close to to do that for you. Or maybe you look at that as another source of revenue moving forward mm -hmm. where you, you go and you change your uniform. And now you're, you know, offering the maintenance for the floors that you've helped install. And that helps them. I know we're talking PPE, but um, I think, you know, home cleanliness and, and maintenance is, is kind of tied to that as well for, for the homeowner, at least. Totally. I, why wouldn't you want to sell being cleaner? to them. I, I think that's part of protecting them. You, if we're going to protect ourselves, why aren't we going to protect our clients? Yeah, and I, sure. you, you know, we've, we've mentioned that you, you've mentioned the silica laws a couple of times. And I, I think those are really interesting because they're written in a way that us as independent business owners, I don't have to follow them. If I'm by myself as a, as a, Sole proprietor, I can go into a home and I don't have to use a shroud on my grinder. I don't have to do dustless tile removal. Like I can make whatever dust cloud I want and it's perfectly legal. But the mm -hmm. minute I hire somebody and I have an employee, I now have to follow them. Yeah. It's cr that's crazy to me. Why is it that it's 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 okay for me? I mean, I get it. I can make that decision that I want to damage myself. I, I I understand it, but it's it's crazy. Why wouldn't you want me just to be that safe all the time if it's that bad? What is yeah. it, it, just tell me that's the rule and and leave it there. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that I think we're good at as as guys, and you know, I'm I'm not assuming the entire audience is guys. I'm not telling the ladies anything they don't know already either. We're pretty good at compartmentalizing. So this part of my work doesn't affect this. This part of my life doesn't affect that. Um, you know, we, we can't work in someone's house in some sort of a complete void or vacuum. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're affecting the environment and the people around us, at least in the immediate workspace. So, you know, just the awareness of that, I think, helps to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I, I mean, you're right. And, and we talked, it's a selling point. Tell your, tell your clients what you're going to do, you know, let them know you're going to use a sweeping compound. Let them know that you only do dustless tile removal. And that's, that's all I do anymore. I, if somebody wants me to come in and remove tile and they're like, well, the other company is at this price. I say, I won't do it. It's, it's not good for your health or mine. And I understand your exposure is much more limited than mine because this is your home. And once you clean it, you're pretty much not exposed anymore, even though there's going to be remnants, but this sure. is this and is me every day of the week being exposed to this stuff, and I can't do that. This is too important to my family. If you want me to do the install, I can do it. But if you want, you know, company X to come out and do the demo, that's fine. I just I can't take that risk for my family or for you. Sure, and you know that's that's a good point. You know that you're they get excited about those kinds of things when you start telling them about you know how excited you are about the technology that you have that's gonna you know the air filters you know those types of things 
that that we're going to help with the process that they don't already want to go through anyways. They don't want to pay to have it done. They don't want to experience all of that. But, you know, also as an alternative, I'll, I'll throw in a shameless plug. You know, you have companies like Shernox that you have you know, product now that are innovating that can help you to avoid demolition a lot of times if the, you know, if your transition heights are correct and if there's something that's either hazardous or, or undesirable in terms of removal, there's other options to encapsulate or, or cap those and not have to, to demolish those floors uh, in a lot of cases. So just another option. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I had to. Uh, yeah, no, I, I get it. And I think there's a there's a couple companies coming out. I'm pretty sure I've heard Ron Nash talk about Lady Creek coming out with stuff that's got less silica dust in it and things like that, too. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm wrong, but I, sure. I think that's just the direction the, the industry is is headed is that that's, you know, it, it was it was asbestos and then it was the aerosol cans and now it's silica dust. And so as soon as we find ways to kind of get the silica dust thing under control, OSHA will go and, and pick something else. Um, sure. And, I think and that's fine. You got to you gotta pick and choose your battles. <laughs> yeah, we, we talk about a lot of things that we need to protect ourselves against. And, and I, I can hear right now where guys are going to go with this and they're going to say, well, you know, there's no way to protect yourself against all of that. So why try anything? I, I would always say just do everything you can. What, you're not going to protect yourself against everything that's hazardous in the workplace or your life, but just make the best effort you can to control as many of those variables as you can. And in and, and the rest of the case, you know, you have to let the chips fall where they may. You know, you can't just use it as an excuse to not do anything. Correct. And I, it goes back to the point, like I know before we made the point of it's just this one cut. It's just this one thing. And the, the, we, we said it added up. And, you know, it is going to affect you long term because it is that one time over and over a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand times, whatever it is. But from yeah. that same vein, OK, if I can protect myself and limit it from a hundred thousand down to eighty thousand because I wore gloves a couple of times and I wore my mask more often, I'd rather have twenty thousand less exposures. Yeah, it's just long term it's going to be better for you. And Absolutely. I don't, you know, who cares if you look ridiculous? You brought up the point, the kid, like, what are, what are they going to think of me? Cause I wear my mask. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> it's, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I post pictures and I got my fingerless gloves on. Yeah. You know what? I've seen the pictures of your knuckles and I know that everybody's proud. All you guys are proud of your, your knuckles that are just, Oh, you got floor guy knuckles. You know what? It looks disgusting to me. I don't want them. So I'm going to wear my fingerless gloves and you can make fun of me all you want. I don't care. Yeah, everybody's got personal choices <laughs> to make. And I think the first time you do it, it's hard. After that, you get used to just being an individual. And not, you know, there's guys out there. I know they'll say all day. I don't, I don't care what anybody says. Use that attitude in the same way. Don't, mm -hmm. don't care what anybody else says about you using your PPE. I mean, just do what you, you know is right for yourself and, and your family and those people around you. And you're going to sleep better at night exactly uh, just you, you got to do you which you know that's that's a given but protect yourself like, like you're you're out there damaging your body as it is just damage it the least amount possible yep uh well i don't i think that pretty well covers it i mean unless you want to get into any specifics that you know about the the silica law or um no, ear I, protection I anything like of, that yeah i think that, that We've done a pretty good job of avoiding the the very you know common discussions that are out there. I think what we've kind of you know tried to do here and, and I think achieved is you know take a more personal and and customizable approach to this topic. And I, I think that you know what we've given people is is really you know a lot of value for the installer and and for their clients as well. I I just think guys you know walk away if they take anything from this you know it's just to you know learn what you can, do everything you can to protect yourself and and the people around you. And you'll have a longer life with a better quality of life for yourself and your family. And who can argue that there's uh, not a lot of you know benefit and value in that? There's you get you only get one shot. So uh, you know just do it as right as you can. I love it. Make it make it the best life you can. Don't That's don't right. try and screw it up. We we do that enough on our own as it is. We don't Absolutely. need any help. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh man. Um. I don't know. We got a little bit of time to kill. We're only at 48 minutes if you want to find something else to talk about. <laughs> it's up to you. you know, I, I think for a topic like, 
I'm, 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 that's why I'm saying it. I, it, I'm okay going shorter. I just know that we, I, I shoot for an hour. That's what the guys of again gals have seemed to like. So we, we got a minute if if we want to go somewhere else. Um, I don't know. What was your you, okay? So here, let's let let's do go a little bit into what we said we wouldn't go into. Let let let's have fun with this. Sure. You were at surfaces. I was there. It was fun. Yes. That was a lot of people. Did you end up sick after surfaces? No, I didn't. I good for I you. Was, Lucky. I I was healthy. I was healthy. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I like I had a little bit of a cold going into it, and then it, it got a little worse afterwards. Um, I don't know. It was that's a lot of people gathering in one spot, and it's just I I, I think it's inevitable that people are going to get sick in in situations like that. And you know, there was let's let's do elbows or foot shakes and I, oh I, that's a big area to like keep clean so it is a lot of handshaking going on there. um correct and and it's just it's such a cultural thing yeah i, that, I i'm a big advocate of going uh transitioning into the bow uh instead of the okay <laughs> I, don't know how I, can, how I can never go back to handshaking again after this uh you know every after everything i learned but um yeah surfaces uh like there was a lot of people there i i at that time, I wasn't, you know, super concerned about a lot of it, uh, mm-hmm. you know, limiting handshake and things like that. It was pretty early on there. Yeah. I think now it's a little bit of a different um, environment where we're at. So, you know, social distancing and cautioning, you know, against those kinds of things uh, is 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 going to be something that I think is obviously a big concern now. And maybe is it going to be again, you know, this time next year? Maybe there's just seasons where we have to, you know, make sure that you know, our PPE includes uh you know our behaviors mm-hmm. and you know our the way we we interact with one another in in certain situations maybe you know crowded environments and being aware of, of other types of things you know obviously that's is that workplace related yes and no uh you know limiting job site walks to a couple people and you know those kinds of things there's no question that that you know, at least moving forward in the immediate future is uh you know is on the table in terms of uh, things we need to do Definitely. Lot lots of things to consider to um continue to keep ourselves safe. It it seems to be an ever growing concern and little things are added to it all the time. But mm-hmm. it's just another tool in the toolbox. Um if we're out here educating ourselves and we're going to try and get better at business, we're going to try and get better at marketing, we're going to try and become better installers, better retailers, better um sorry i got dropped there oh i apologize i had someone calling and coming in um i i i had i had another call come in and i hit the wrong button i apologize oh no problem but you're back uh i was just rambling on to myself um (laughs) i i i so it's it's another tool in the toolbox we've got uh you know if if social distancing has to become a tool in the toolbox for personal protection i don't think that's a bad thing you know we're here we're here doing this podcast so that we can be better business people better marketers better installers better retailers better reps better whatever in the flooring industry so if we're if we're constantly adding tools then let's keep adding tools and and things are going to change and evolve over time we can't we don't need to be the guy that's grumpy at at 56 saying i've been doing it that way for 40 years and that's the way it is man just put the mask on shut up put the mask on it'll be good for you it's uncomfortable i I think at at the end of the day really um it's it's comforting and and it's it's helpful to a homeowner to to see someone that they might interview or, or have come out and give them a job quote or even your gc you know on your commercial job and just come away from that meeting getting the sense that hey you know this guy thinks about a lot more than just cashing the check Mm -hmm. you know you've thought through the process you understand what it takes to get from point a to point b and you understand not only the skill set that's involved but all of the others you know the other things that are that are in that process to help it you know run smoothly efficiently and and you know as as healthy as as possible and for for everyone involved and that's like I said, this this always comes back to, you know, from a business standpoint to value. 
the value added, you know, what are you adding to the job so that you can, you can help make, uh, you know, make the, the provisions and, and see this as a benefit instead of uh, something that's going to be hindering you and, and there's value in it. Correct. Your, your premium price will not look so premium when you show all of the value behind it. Yeah. But you have to remember to explain it. You can't, you have to explain it when you're on site. You can't just necessarily add it into the the estimate paperwork or the proposal because it could get skipped over. It could get missed. So yeah, th- there's a time yeah. to sell it and you, and you've got to sell it. Here's an example. Um, you know, we say that story, you know, stories sell, right? Stories sell things. They, they mm-hmm. help make you relatable and they, and they give someone something to remember. Um, maybe 15 years ago, we did a job for a lady um, down in Ann Arbor who was one of the very health conscious type of people, you know, everyone's kind of had these customers. They say, I'm allergic to every adhesive, every liquid, uh, every compound known to man. And, um, you know, they're, they're, what are you going to use to do the installs so that I can rest assured knowing that I won't have an allergic reaction to, uh, you know, your Coca-Cola, uh, or whatever that's on the job, you know, exaggerating obviously. But, um, when you go into a job, uh, this, she had said no adhesives, no caulks, no sealants, no, no, none of these types of things. So it's funny, but you know, I, I've used this story and I remember it. We actually had to take, uh, put shoe molding up after the finished flooring was, was installed and we filled the holes with Tom's of Maine toothpaste because it was an organic toothpaste filler. And, you know, she loved it. She thought it was the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to use caulk. We, we literally filled the shoe holes with, with toothpaste um you know it's it's a it's a strange thing but it's accommodating if it works what are you gonna do you know i i I had a guy that i went and installed some transitions for and he had to find the flooring that was made with special adhesives the um research guy right yeah, I mean, it took him months and months to figure it out. So then the glue that I used, the, he purchased the glue that I would use to put the transition pieces in because mm-hmm. it wasn't going to affect his, like, horrible asthma. There, yeah. There's products out there. Like, you can accommodate these people, but it's going to take you time. And yeah. But th- it comes with a cost. They know that, and they're going to appreciate what you do for them. You, you don't yes. have to bend over backwards and... Okay, I'll I'll a dollar a square foot, a dollar twenty five a square foot. No, go get paid. Yes. So, love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, man, thank you once again. Truly, like, just to to be to open up like that to to an audience. I I truly appreciate it. I and I I knew you were willing, but that doesn't mean that you have to do it. You know, it's, it's not easy. Um, I, I, I truly do appreciate you coming on and being able to talk about something that's so personal to you and, and really be able to get down deep into it and convey why it means something to you. Cause I'll, I'll be honest, man. When I, when I saw your video on flooring installers of America at, at first, like it hit home with me because it was, it, even though I didn't know you in person mm-hmm. yet, it was somebody that did something that I did and I was able to see their emotion, their expressions, you know, because I could see you in the video. Like I, it, it really hit home and I started taking stuff more seriously at that point. It, it wasn't like, I'm just going to go sweep up this room and let the breathe in all this dust. So yeah. it, I, you know, it's, it's awesome of you. Like I can't thank you enough for being willing to be vulnerable like that. Uh, absolutely no i i really appreciate it because it, you know if, if one person the next time they go to you know get a job or or get a tool out of the truck if they think about their health and and they make a personal change or a decision to you know get in the habit of doing things in a way that's going to help them uh, and their family then it's worth it you know it's just that's what what it takes sometimes is for us to see that uh you know it's it's not it's not just a thing that people talk about it's something that happens to real people uh, and people that we know. So I'm always eager to get the opportunity to share and, you know, visiting job sites, you know, asking if guys have, you know, shop bags before I get there, even doing training and things. I'm, I'm one step ahead of it to try and help 
them not only learn how to use product uh, when we do trainings and things, but to help them understand the healthiest way to do it um, so that, you know, for themselves and, and their job sites, they can be better and be healthier, uh, you know, moving forward. So I would greatly appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come on again. No problem. Uh, if somebody wants to schedule in the, let's see, it was Michigan, Toledo, and Northern Indiana, correct? Yes, correct. Yep. If, if somebody is in that area and they want to get a hold of you to schedule a, a product demo, which I know that you can't necessarily do right now, but I know you came online and did some stuff. How do they get a hold of you if they want to talk PPE with you or your story with you about your dad? Where do they find you? Yeah, so my my email is jwaldorf at hpsubfloors.com. My phone number is 517-316-5380. Uh, you know, I'm obviously, we're doing demos and trainings all around the country uh, under normal circumstances as much as we can, you know, during this time. But we also have uh, online webinars I'll be sharing, you know, also online. And, and, you know, you'll have the link for that for anyone to get training for the products and things in the meantime and do some more of the, you know, the virtual type stuff, but I'm always open to, you know, conversations about PPE as well. Um, you know, in addition to the Shernox, uh, you know, training and what we do, you know, for the business, like I said, a lot of the dust reduce technologies and, you know, minimizing the demolition, uh, you know, looking at more renovation type stuff. I've got a lot of ideas for, you know, for you, if, if, if you're looking to, to do things differently, it's not that I know everything. It's just that, you know, you, you talk to people and you see what works good for other people and uh, you, you make it part of your, your routine and, mm-hmm. and it's just helpful. So I'm, I'm always available to anybody who uh, you know wants to reach out on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn. Uh, it's not hard to find me. And I obviously don't mind talking. So <laughs> whenever I need to help, uh, I'm, I'm willing. No, nope, totally appreciate it. Uh, you are a, you know, I, I love building friendships with everybody that I've, I've I've met through the different Facebook groups and have been able to meet in person. And it, it, this isn't like a, a knock, I, but you are a great tool to have in the toolbox. Um, Thank and you. anybody would be a fool not to keep you in, in their contacts. Um, just you, you have a lot of knowledge and experience. And now you, you continue to gain more because you're looking at, you're not just looking at your jobs, you're looking at tons of people's jobs. So you're going to pick up tips, tricks, and things from all over the place. So, um, I've got a lot, uh, I've got a lot more to learn. I'm, I'm learning every day. So that's, I, that's I, I'm it. always encouraged to get in with another group of guys and see what they can teach me too. And, you know, whether, no matter what part of the country you're in, if you're looking for, you know, any type of, of help, uh, you know, you or I, or, or someone else can help point them in the right direction. We've got a community of, in this trade of, of guys who tend to be, you know, pretty helpful and, and encouraging to one another. So I'm, I'm glad to be, the flooring trade is, is, a, is a place I'm proud of and, and yes. proud to be a part of. Totally. You got to learn while you earn. That's uh, that's our motto around here. Yeah, that's and pretty good. You're, you're still doing that. And we're we're doing that right now. We're putting this out so that guys can fill their ear holes while they while they earn. So once again, thank you, Jeremy. I, I appreciate your time. Um, I hope things get back to normal here soon for everybody and we can we can all enjoy some job sites and stuff. Um, they will soon. Yeah. Uh, so awesome. I, I'm sure we will come up with another topic in the in the future and I, I look forward to it. Likewise. Thank you, Kyle, for having me on again. I appreciate it and work work hard and stay safe. Will do. Talk to you later, buddy. Bye bye. Bye. That's all the time we have for this week. To keep the conversation going, head on over to the Floor Education Facebook group. Be sure to subscribe so you can hear each and every episode. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and most major podcast directories. Don't forget to leave a review and let us know what you think about the show. If you'd like to be a guest, have questions or feedback, you can email us at flooreducation at gmail.com. You can help support the show by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash flooreducation. Remember, your education never stops.